Arlene Fraser, a 33-year-old mother of two, from Elgin, Scotland, disappeared in late April 1998. The authorities have never discovered her remains to date, though one perpetrator was brought to justice after almost a decade of legal wrangling in courts of two different countries. Arlene Fraser was born in Elgin, Scotland, in 1965. The 33-year-old mother vanished hours after waving her children Natalie, then 11, and Jamie, then 6, off to school on April 28, 1998. Her contact lenses, watches, rings, and medicine to treat her Crohn's disease were left behind in her home, and there were no signs of any struggle. There have been no reported sightings, and her bank account showed no activities. However, the authorities believed she was dead after leading a futile search for her for around six months. Detective Chief Inspector Peter Simpson said in late October 1998 that Grampian police had found no evidence that the mother of two was still alive. I believe that she's dead. There's no indication that she's living somewhere else. Arlene's family also agreed with the detective's assessment, with her sister, Carol Gillies. Alleging, I feel a sense of loss. I feel Arlene is dead. I feel something has happened to Arlene that is beyond Arlene's control. Arlene wouldn't put us through all this. Her remains have not been discovered to date. Arlene was reported missing on the evening of April 28th, and her father, Hector McInnes, other relatives, police officers and community members searched the countryside around Elgin in northeast Scotland. The law enforcement also conducted a fruitless search of the area, using helicopters from nearby Rafe Lossiemouth, mountain rescue teams, search dogs, and police divers. Her mother, Isabel Thompson, emotionally appealed for her daughter to make contact, while the authorities announced a £20,000 reward for information. After an inquiry that cost £250,000 and included interviews with over 1,000 people, Grampian Police Detective Simpson said, The only conclusion that's still left open to us, which I firmly believe has happened, is that something criminal has taken place here, and that Arlene has been the victim of a crime. Then, her estranged husband, Nat, was considered a person of interest after reports indicated he'd physically abused his wife after she arrived home from a night out with friends in March 1998. In a chilling prophecy, Fraser told her weeks before she vanished, if you are not going to live with me, you will not be living with anyone. Around the time she went missing, Fraser was spotted pacing around and his hands were shaking. As the days wore on in the search for her, the family were frantically hoping for information, but Fraser seemed calm, collected, not fussed. Within days, he was back to his normal self and made bad taste remarks, including one incident when he held up a toy mustache and joked it was the disguise the missing woman used to run away. He also told her father that the children would soon forget their mother when nobody else knew she was dead. A former police officer said the inaction shown by Fraser when his wife was missing was unique in his 40 years with the force. Advocate Deputy Ruth Anderson Queen's counsel stated, Nat grabbed Arlene and compressed her neck. As a result of that, she fell to the floor of the bathroom. Reports further claimed she later told her friends she might have lost consciousness because of the attack. And her family doctor found bruising on her left shoulder, upper chest, left arm, and back. After observing substantial bruising on her neck and hemorrhaging on her eyelids, telltale signs of strangling, Arlene reported the incident to the police. Nat was arrested for attempted murder and was out on bail when Arlene disappeared. However, the investigators stated they were satisfied with his account of his whereabouts on April 28th. He had even joined the search for his estranged wife and said, I still live in hope that someday she'll turn up. In February 2000, Nat, then 41, admitted a reduced charge of assault after the prosecution agreed to drop the attempted murder charges, much to her family's disappointment, and received a two-year sentence, but was released in December 1998. 
Meanwhile, Nat and his friend, Moray farmer Hector Dick, were charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice over their alleged knowledge of a car, a beige Ford Fiesta, bought on the eve of Arlene's disappearance. The prosecution alleged Hector had been recorded discussing the missing car with Kevin Ritchie, who allegedly sold him the vehicle. Hector told the police the Ford Fiesta had been crushed at an Elgin scrapyard. He pled guilty to a slightly lesser charge and tried to hang himself during his one-year sentence. In June 2001, Glenn Lucas faced charges for attempting to pervert the course of justice in the case. On April 26, 2002, the Crown Office indicted Nat, Glenn, and Hector for Arlene's murder. The charges included conspiracy to murder, actual murder, and obstructing justice. Reports stated a forensic lip-reading expert analyzed prison CCTV footage to ascertain Nat had allegedly made incriminating statements to a visitor. The controversial analysis resulted in him being charged with his wife's murder. Before the January 2003 trial, the prosecution dropped the charges against Glenn and Hector, with the latter becoming a witness against Nat. He later admitted to destroying a car linked to her disappearance but denied further involvement. As the trial continued, Nat's defense focused on his alibi of working for his fruit and vegetable business during his wife's disappearance. However, he was found guilty of murder despite the police never recovering her body on January 29, 2003, and sentenced to life with a minimum of 25 years the Court of Appeal granted permission for Nat's December 2003 appeal in May 2004. An October 2005 documentary suggested Hector had lied during the trial, prompting inquiries into the evidence available and its handling. Nat was released from prison in May 2006 during his appeal. However, fresh allegations surfaced, causing controversy. The appeal process continued with claims of evidence withholding and police deception. The Supreme Court eventually refused his plea in May 2008, prompting Nat to seek leave to appeal at the Privy Council, which was also denied. A November 2009 further appeal contended unfairness under human rights legislation was also rejected in January 2010. However, Nat won his appeal in the Supreme Court in London in May 2011. The London Apex Court remitted the case for consideration of a new prosecution. Nat faced his second trial in the Edinburgh High Court in 2012. The judge soon stated the evidence pointed toward Nat's orchestration of his wife's premeditated murder and disposal of her body. He was thus again found guilty in May 2012, with the verdict attributing him to Arlene's murder and handing him a minimum sentence of 17 years. Then, in 2018, he had six months added to his term after being caught with a cell phone in prison. Therefore, he, now in his mid-sixties, is incarcerated in Low Moss Prison. All the while, his supporters continue to maintain his innocence. In the early hours of June 23, 1993, a 24-year-old woman named Lorena Bobbitt picked up a kitchen knife, walked into the bedroom where her husband John Bobbitt was sleeping and cut off his penis. Then, Lorena took the severed appendage and fled the couple's home in Manassas, Virginia. By the next day, news of what Lorena had done to John had begun to spread, first among the police officers who searched for his penis in a field then by the surgeons who reattached the member to his body, and then by the national media that reported on the shocking story. Men across the country winced in sympathy. Late-night comedians made endless jokes. And in the ensuing criminal trial that captivated the nation, Lorena was cast as a hot-tempered Latina who was enraged by her failing marriage and her husband's inability to sexually satisfy her. The truth, however, was more complex. Lorena Bobbitt's story is less about her husband's penis and more about the toxicity of her marriage, the abuse that she allegedly suffered, and the shards of her American dream. Born in 1969 in Bouquet, 
Ecuador, Lorena Bobbitt grew up in Caracas, Venezuela, where she enjoyed a normal and happy childhood as the eldest of three children. When she was 15, her life changed after her parents gifted her a trip to the United States for her quinceanera. I feel like, oh wow, this is like another planet, another place, Lorena stated. I said to myself, oh my God, this is the place I want to be. At first, Lorena's entire family tried to emigrate to the US when that proved impossible. Lorena went alone, getting a student visa in 1987. Along the way, she took English classes, worked as a manicurist, and made friends. Then, in 1988, Lorena met John Bobbitt at a club for enlisted men near the Quantico Marine Base in Stafford, Virginia, John, and Lorena Bobbitt locked eyes for the first time. Both later admitted that their initial attraction was powerful. John spotted Lorena across the room and, to her delight, asked her to dance. I thought John was very handsome, Lorena stated in an interview. Blue eyes. A man in a uniform, you know? He was almost like a symbol. A marine, fighting for the country. I believed in this beautiful country. I was swept off my feet. I wanted my American dream. Lorena and John soon married on June 18, 1989. But Lorena's American dream quickly became a nightmare. When they had sex for the first time, Lorena felt that John was rough. He made decisions without consulting Lorena. And shortly after they wed, John allegedly started hitting her. Lorena later said that John frequently beat her raped her, and even forced her to get an abortion when she got pregnant. He also bullied her while she was waiting to have the procedure done. Meanwhile, John bounced from job to job, creating financial stress, which Lorena says led her to embezzle $7,200 from her employer. Nail salon owner Jana Bissetti, she was the meal ticket and the punching bag, her lawyer later stated. Basuti agreed stating in 1993 that Lorena was going to do anything to try to make her marriage work. As time went on, the couple's relationship remained volatile. They split in October 1991, only to reunite just a year later. And less than a year after that, Lorena Bobbitt would become a household name when she cut off John's penis. So what exactly happened on June 23, 1993? As Lorena Bobbitt tells it, the early morning of June 23rd unfolded much like many others in her marriage. She and John had recently agreed to separate again, but were still living together. And when John came home after a night of drinking, he barged into their bedroom and brutally raped Lorena. Afterward, Lorena said that she went to their kitchen to get a glass of water, and something seemed to snap inside of her. I was thinking many things, she recalled. I was thinking the first time he hit me. I was thinking when he raped me. I was thinking so many things, just really quick. I don't know, I just wanted him to disappear. I just wanted him to leave me alone, to leave my life alone. I don't want to see him anymore. A kitchen knife on the counter caught her eye. She then picked it up, went back to the bedroom, and cut off her sleeping husband's penis. As John stumbled out of bed, terrified and bleeding profusely. Lorena fled in her 1991 Mercury Capri, still clutching her husband's severed appendage. She stated that she didn't even realize that she was holding it at first. I remember I couldn't make a turn because my hands had something on them, and so I tried to turn. But then I saw that I have it in my hand, Lorena explained. I looked at it, and I scream, and I throw it out of the window. Meanwhile, John alerted a friend who'd been staying with the couple to his condition, and the friend quickly took him to a nearby hospital. Lorena eventually went to the house of her employer, who called the police. Once officers arrived, Lorena told them where they could find John's penis, in a grassy field opposite a 7-Eleven. According to reports, they quickly located it, put it on ice, and stored it in a big bite hot dog box. Incredibly, Doctors were able to reattach the appendage after a nine and a half hour surgery. 
and soon afterward, both John and Lorena Bobbitt became household names as their trials captivated the nation. In the aftermath of the incident, both Lorena and John Bobbitt were arrested. Lorena was charged with malicious wounding. John faced charges of marital sexual assault. Many media organizations questioned whether marital rape was an oxymoron. There were no cameras allowed at John's trial due to the charge against him, and he was acquitted in November 1993. In contrast, Lorena Bobbitt's trial was a media circus. CNN provided wall-to-wall -wall coverage, and her case prompted comment from the likes of David Letterman, who included Lorena in a top 10 list, and Howard Stern, who defended John, and declared, I don't even buy that he was raping her. She's not that great looking. Many media organizations also clung to a memorable statement that Lorena had made to police shortly after the incident, when she said, he always have orgasm and he doesn't wait for me to have an orgasm. He's selfish. I don't think it's fair, so I pull back the sheets, and then I did it. Lorena's lawyer later said that she was trying to explain the long-term abuse that she'd suffered at John's hands. At her trial, multiple witnesses testified that they'd seen bruises on Lorena inflicted by John, and that they'd witnessed him abusing her. But her orgasm quote convinced many commentators that she'd attacked her husband out of sexual dissatisfaction. John, for his part, claimed that Lorena attacked because he was leaving her. If she couldn't have me, no one could, he later said in an interview. And there was the green card, too. That didn't come to my mind at the time, but it's obvious. You have to be married to an American citizen for five years to get one, and we'd only been married for four. In the end, Lorena was found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity and ordered to spend five weeks at a mental hospital. By 1995, she and John had officially divorced and went their separate ways, in very different paths. After her trial, Lorena Bobbitt was eager to retreat from the spotlight. She started using the name Lorena Gallo again, successfully became an American citizen, and focused on rebuilding her life. Though Playboy offered her $1 million to pose for the magazine, she turned them down. A million dollars is a million dollars, she stated. It would have been amazing, but I wasn't raised that way. Instead, Lorena went back to school, began a romantic relationship with a new man named David Bellinger, which has lasted for more than 20 years, and eventually had a daughter with Bellinger. In 2007, she created a foundation to help victims of domestic abuse, Lorena's Red Wagon. John Bobbitt, however, took a different path. After moving to Las Vegas, he and his infamous penis starred in several porn films. John also rotated through multiple girlfriends, some of whom later accused him of domestic violence. All the while, he seemed fixated on his ex-wife. He continued to write Lorena letters as late as 2019. But Lorena, for her part, has moved on. Looking back at what happened in 1993, she's concluded that most people focused on all the wrong things. Caught up in the can't-miss nature of her trial, they largely ignored the violence she said that she'd suffered at the hands of her husband. The media was focusing only on the penis, the sensationalistic, the scandalous, she stated. But I wanted to shine the light on this issue of spousal abuse. I am not a celebrity. I'm an advocate. In 1989, someone brutally attacked and murdered 14-year-old Stephanie Isaacson on her way to school in Las Vegas. But they left behind a tiny clue. Now, using the remains of just 15 human cells, investigators have finally solved the cold case and named Darren Marchand as her killer. I'm glad they found who murdered my daughter, Isaacson's mother, who was not named, said in a statement. I never believed the case would be solved. Indeed, Isaacson's murder case had languished for decades. With no suspects and little evidence, it seemed to get colder with each passing day. 
That is, until a local philanthropist named Justin Wu offered to pay for the services of a genome sequencing firm. At that point, the Las Vegas police turned over their DNA evidence to Othram, a Texas-based lab that focuses specifically on cold cases. And slowly, Othram began to build a genetic profile based on semen found on Isaacson's shirt. They didn't have much to go on, however. Popular at home DNA tests often collect up to 1,000 nanograms of DNA. But DNA evidence is harder to detect at crime scenes, where investigators often find only tens to hundreds of nanograms. They had just 12 nanograms of DNA to test in the Isaacson case. In other words, they were tasked with finding a killer based on the smallest DNA sample ever used. Nevertheless, after working with the DNA for seven months, Othram had a name. They pinpointed Darren Marchand as Stephanie Isaacson's killer. This was a huge milestone, noted Othram Chief Executive David Middleman. When you can access information from such a small amount of DNA, it really opens up the opportunity to so many other cases that have been historically considered cold and unsolvable. Though Marchand had died by suicide in 1995, his identification put an end to the decades-old hunt for who ended Stephanie Isaacson's life that day. In 1989, questions still remain about his motive, however. That afternoon, Isaacson's father grew concerned when Isaacson didn't return home. He called her high school, her friends, and finally, the police. An intensive search soon found Isaacson's body 25 yards off the trail she normally took to school. According to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, she had significant blunt force trauma injuries, and she had been sexually assaulted. Isaacson had been bludgeoned, raped, and strangled. It appears to be a random attack while she was walking to school, said Lieutenant Ray Spencer. But from there, the case went cold. Investigators chased leads throughout the country, looking into suspects in Washington State, Texas, and Ohio. They tried to use the scant DNA they'd collected at the scene, testing it once in 1998 and once in 2007. The Las Vegas police even uploaded it to a national database. Despite their best efforts, the case went nowhere. It took powerful new DNA technology and Wu's donation to solve the case for good. The DNA evidence led police to Marchand, who, indeed, had a history of violence toward women. In 1986, police arrested Marchand for the fatal strangling of 24-year-old Nanette Vanderberg. He walked free in that case due to a lack of evidence. Marchand's DNA from the case involving Vanderberg was compared to the DNA located in Stephanie's case, and it was a match the Las Vegas police said in a statement. The Stephanie Isaacson murder is far from the first in which DNA evidence caught a killer, although it did use the smallest sample of DNA to date. Police famously used DNA technology to identify the Golden State Killer, who raped dozens of women and killed 12 people in California between 1976 and 1986. But although DNA evidence can bring closure, it can't always bring justice. As Stephanie Isaacson's mother said in a statement, it's good to have some closure, but there is no justice for Stephanie at all. We will never have complete closure because nothing will ever bring my daughter back to us. A New Zealand chef who committed the first murder on Norfolk Island in more than a century is set to be released from prison in just weeks. The body of 29-year-old Janelle Patton was found wrapped in a black plastic sheet at the island's cockpit waterfall reserve on Easter Sunday, 2002. Ms. Patton had suffered 64 injuries, including stab wounds, a fractured skull, and broken pelvis, and her death led to a police investigation that made headlines around the world. More than two decades later, despite Glenn Peter Charles McNeil's conviction for Ms. Patton's murder, her killing remains a subject of debate in true crime podcasts and among amateur sleuths. 
McNeil's story about what happened on the day Ms. Patton was killed repeatedly changed after his arrest, and no motive was ever established for her murder. Ms. Patton, who worked in hospitality, had moved to Norfolk Island to escape a bad relationship in Sydney, more than two years before her life was taken by McNeil. Relationship troubles continued to befall her, with several failed affairs and occasional angry encounters with local men and women. Ms. Patton was last seen alive on the morning of March 31st, heading off on her daily walk around the island, where her parents had honeymooned. Detectives sent from the Australian mainland had to be sworn in as Norfolk Island constables before they could speak to the 2,771 residents and visitors on the island at the time. Ms. Patton's parents Ron and Carol had been visiting Norfolk for Easter when their daughter was murdered and had every reason to believe the crime would be quickly solved. Police knew the names of every person present on the island which covers just 35 square kilometers and sits about 1,400 kilometers east of Evans, head on the New South Wales north coast. Instead, the hunt for Ms. Patton's killer dragged on for years as islanders insisted it could not be one of them. Despite a 2004 coronial inquest, hearing there were 16 local persons of interest. Among those named was a man accused of pulling Ms. Patton's hair at the league's club and another with whom she described sex as not rape. But not what I wanted. The inquest heard Ms. Patton had fought mightily for perhaps 15 minutes as she was bashed, slashed, and stabbed to death by sharp and blunt instruments. Ms. Patton's diary entries included references to one former island boyfriend, spitting on her and later describing himself as her first enemy on Norfolk. About half the territory's population is descended from British sailors who mutinied against naval officer William Bly on His Majesty's ship Bounty in 1789. The mutineers, led by Fletcher Christian, hid on Pitcairn Island with their Tahitian wives and their descendants, were resettled in 1856 on the former penal colony of Norfolk. Those real islanders form about a third of the permanent population the Buffet, Quintal, Nobbs, Evans, McCoy, Adams, Young, and Christian families. They speak a mix of archaic English and Tahitian, but only among themselves, and the Norfolk phone book includes their nicknames in its listings. Early in the homicide investigation, Australian Federal Police fingerprinted most of the island's adults, but did not find a match for evidence found at the crime scene. In February 2006, four years after the discovery of Ms. Patton's body, 28-year-old father of two McNeil was arrested in New Zealand. McNeil had been questioned over a burglary shortly after Ms. Patton's murder and his fingerprints were taken, along with a DNA sample, both of which were re-examined in 2004. Two of the prints found on the plastic sheet used to wrap Ms. Patton's body belonged to McNeil and hairs matching her DNA were located in the boot of his Honda Civic. Broken pieces of green glass removed from Ms. Patton's hair were also similar to particles recovered from that vehicle. The only foreign DNA detected on Ms. Patton's body was from an unidentified female. McNeil had arrived on Norfolk in 2000 with his girlfriend and worked at several island restaurants before returning to his homeland after Ms. Patton was killed. He initially claimed on the day Ms. Patton disappeared, he had been smoking cannabis and accidentally ran over her while driving his Civic. I was just driving along the road and I dropped my smokes, McNeil told detectives. I bent down to pick them up and hit her. At first, I thought I'd hit a cow or a dog. I got out and saw that she was under the car and I panicked. McNeil said he put Patton's body in the boot of his car, which he drove to Cockpit Waterfall Reserve, stabbing her only to make sure she was dead. He later retracted that statement, and in February 2007, faced trial in front of a jury drawn from fewer than 2,000 of the island's eligible voters. McNeil gave evidence he did not kill Patton or see her on the day she was murdered, and claimed if he had made a confession, it was due to mental illness. Barrister Peter Garling, now a New South Wales Supreme Court judge, 
put forward the proposition Patton had been killed in a jealous rage by a woman. The jury found McNeil guilty, and he was sentenced to 24 years in prison, with a minimum term that expires on February 1st. McNeil, who has served his time in New South Wales jails, unsuccessfully appealed against his conviction to the federal court, and the high court refused leave to appeal. Three years after his conviction, the US broadcaster NBC aired an episode of Dateline, in which McNeil's girlfriend, Shelley Hooper, offered a fresh story about the murder. Ms. Hooper said Patton had been killed by a drug-dealing couple who forced McNeil to dispose of her body. McNeil later made the same claim from prison, adding he had been wearing surgical gloves, which he buried in his garden. Police searched McNeil's former property, but no gloves were found. Norfolk Island lawyer John Brown, who represented McNeil, stated there were quite a few inconsistencies in the case against his one-time client. One was that the only DNA found on the deceased person was female, Mr. Brown said, and there's no way he could have put female DNA on the deceased person. McNeil was expected to serve his parole in New Zealand after his likely release was confirmed by the Supreme Court of Norfolk Island. Dellen Millard was a man who liked the fast life. At 14, he had set a record by becoming the youngest Canadian to fly solo a helicopter and an airplane on the same day. By 27, he would own several million dollar properties and a fleet of luxury cars. Born in 1985 as the scion of a dwindling aviation dynasty, he spent his days working for his father Wayne. His seemingly breezy existence was not without its dark spots. His parents divorced when he was a teen, and in November 2012, his father was found dead in bed with a bullet wound in his head. He carried some great sadness with him throughout life that I never knew he never wanted to share that with me. He told police the day after his father's death, which would be ruled a suicide. But Millard's playboy persona came crashing down on May 14, 2013, when he was charged with first-degree murder for the death of Tim Bosma, a total stranger. Soon, Millard found himself facing not one, but three separate first-degree murder trials for the deaths of Bosma, his ex Laura Babcock, and his own father. If it was not for his truck, Bosma may still have been alive today and Millard may never have been charged with his father's murder. The 32-year-old family man was trying to sell his diesel vehicle, and his wife Charlene Bosma had posted an ad online. The Bosmas had a two-year-old daughter and wanted to grow the family. Money was tight, and getting rid of the truck would ease their burdens. On May 6, 2013, Millard and his friend Mark Smike arrived at the Bosma family home outside of Hamilton, Ontario, to take the truck for a test drive. When they come, should I go with them? Bosma had asked his wife. Yes, you should, because we want the truck to come back, she replied. She never saw him again. After he did not respond to her many texts and voicemails, Mrs. Bosma reported her husband missing. On May 8th, Mrs. Bosma gave a heart-wrenching news conference in which she pleaded for her husband's safe return it was just a truck, a stupid truck, she said. You do not need him, but I do. Our daughter needs her daddy. Four days later, police found Bosma's truck in a trailer on the property of Millard's mother. The truck had been stripped, but gunshot residue and traces of his blood were found inside. Human remains were later found in an incinerator on Millard's farm, too charred to be identifiable by their DNA. Millard and Smitch were charged with first-degree murder for the death of Bosma. Shortly after their arrest, police began to look into two other unsettling cases that shared one thing in common, Millard. The first was the disappearance of Babcock, Millard's ex-girlfriend, who went missing in July 2012. In the months leading up to her disappearance, Babcock had led a troubled life, described by family and friends as typically bubbly and outgoing. She had also dealt with anxiety and depression for much of her life. That summer, 
she was fighting with her parents over house rules, and she was couch surfing with friends and escort clients, her friends told the court. She and Millard had dated briefly in 2008-2009 and may have continued their sexual relationship while Millard was dating Christina Nudga. Nudja pleaded guilty in 2016 to obstructing justice and helping Millard destroy evidence in Bosma's murder. She quarreled with Babcock, who sent taunting texts to Nudja to claim she was still sleeping with Millard. During Millard's trial for Babcock's murder, prosecutors alleged that Millard killed Babcock to get out of the love triangle. Months before Babcock went missing, Millard texted Nudja to say, First, I'm going to hurt her. Then I'll make her leave. I will remove her from our lives. Miller did not act alone. At his side was always Mark Smitch, who was also convicted of first-degree murder for the deaths of Babcock and Bosma. It was Smitch who went on the test drive in Bosma's truck. It was Smitch who helped Millard plan Babcock's murder, the court heard. It was also Smitch who provided an alibi for Millard the night of his father's death. Unlike Millard, Smitch came from a middle-class family and had a record for minor crimes like drug possession and driving under the influence. He made his money from drug dealing, in which Millard also allegedly partook. The pair met in 2006 and bonded over video games and weed, the court heard. The two also liked to steal things for the fun of it, from trees to construction equipment. By 2012, Smitch was living in Millard's basement. But by the time the two were charged with Bosma and Babcock's deaths, the friendship had soured. They retained separate legal counsel and each said the other person was the one to shoot Bosma. Millard inherited millions when his father died, but his assets were frozen once he was charged with his murder. After being convicted of Bosma's murder in 2016, and facing another expensive trial for Babcock's murder in 2017, Millard claimed he was broke. Although he had owned millions of dollars of property, he had transferred most of this portfolio to his mother after his arrest. Denied legal aid by the judge, Millard took the unusual step of representing himself. That is how, on the first day of the trial, Millard found himself standing across from Babcock's father asking him what he knew about his daughter's life. This can't be easy for you, being questioned by me, considering I'm the accused. Does this make it extra difficult? Millard pressed. No, Mr. Babcock replied, determined to get through the exchange. Millard had a strained relationship with his own father, the court would later hear. He played the dutiful son in public, but in private he buckled under his father's expectations. He was patient and stubborn. He admired Christ, Gandhi, and Lindbergh. He wrote in his father's obituary in the Toronto Star, two weeks after his death. He believed animal welfare was a humanitarian effort. He was a good man in a careless world. He was my father. But employees at Millard Air said there had been tensions between Millard and his father. There was even talk the heir was going to be cut off because of his extravagant spending. During the trial for his father's murder, the court heard how Millard wanted nothing to do with his father's new business venture, an airplane maintenance and repair business the elder Millard hoped would revive the lagging family legacy. The last time I spoke to him, I told him the company's financial troubles were his doing, and that he was a failure. Millard wrote in a text that was presented in court. Usually, he tells me not to worry, but this time he said maybe I was right. The night of his father's death, Millard said he was at his friend Mark Smick's house. Millard was the one who discovered the body the next morning, but instead of calling 911 immediately, he had called his mother, who had been divorced from his father for more than a decade. Millard was also the one who told police about his father's depressive mood. But phone records reveal he traveled back to his father's house, hours before he said he found the body. A gun purchased illegally by Millard was also found next to his father with Millard's DNA on it. In September 2018, after the verdict was read and Millard was declared a three-time murderer, the father of Laura Babcock addressed reporters outside the courtroom. 
it's been proven that not only the Bosmas and ourselves lost a loved one. The Millard family must live with the fact that this heinous individual murdered his own father. Both Millard and Smitch were convicted of first-degree murder and given two consecutive life sentences for the deaths of Babcock and Bosma. Millard awaits sentencing for his father's death. Prosecutors will likely ask for another consecutive life sentence. In the early hours of June 26, 2011, Stephen McDaniel broke into the apartment of his neighbor and fellow Mercer University Law School graduate Lauren Giddings, then murdered her and dismembered her body. On June 29th, Giddings' family and friends reported her missing. When local news media in Macon, Georgia heard about her disappearance, they sent a camera crew to her apartment complex. There, on June 30th, Reporters from the television station WGXA conducted an interview with McDaniel. During the interview, McDaniel posed as a concerned neighbor. He described Giddings as nice as can be and very personable. But shortly into the interview, McDaniel's behavior took a dramatic turn. After he learned from the reporter that a body had been found, his worry turned to utter panic. Body? He said, visibly anxious. I think I need to sit down. I was living there? Yeah, Lauren was my neighbor. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out, and I mean, no one's heard from her since. Did you see her hang out with anyone at the time? I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, you always hear noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. And you, uh, she just recently graduated from Mercer? Yeah, she and I were, we were both JD students. Um, we graduated back in May. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you, what did you see? I mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much a people person. Do you know anybody that, any enemies she might have had, somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I am we're, we don't know where she is. I mean, the only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. Because, I mean, we went, at, we went over, one of her friends had a key. We went inside and tried to see if there was anything amiss. But, I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it. So there was no sign that anyone broke in. I mean, the door was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. I mean, what about um, in the, like, the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard, any, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? I, I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if this is the same person or not. So that's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay. Though some may have initially thought that McDaniel's reaction was merely the shock of losing a friend, police named him as a person of interest in the investigation just one day later. And it was later revealed that McDaniel was indeed the one who had killed Giddings and butchered her body. Given the nature of the crime, the brutality of it, and how little contact McDaniel had with Giddings prior to the murder. Many believe that had he not been caught, he would have gone on to kill even more women. Stephen McDaniel was born on September 9, 1985, and grew up near Atlanta, Georgia. His early life was unremarkable, but as a young man, he was academically inclined enough to graduate from Mercer University's law school. His future victim, Lauren Giddings was another graduate. By 2011, both 25-year-old McDaniel and 27-year-old Giddings lived in the same apartment complex, a short distance from the school's campus. At the time, Giddings was preparing to take the bar exam and then start a promising career as a defense attorney. But tragically, while Giddings had been preparing for the bar, McDaniel had been preparing for her murder. At first glance, McDaniel didn't seem like he had it in him to commit such a heinous crime. 
As the Macon Telegraph reported, it didn't even seem like he was staying in town for much longer. The lease on his apartment was up in two weeks, and he reportedly planned on moving back in with his parents. But as police would later discover, McDaniel had been posting on the internet about his hatred of women and his desire to torture them. Oddly enough, he was also something of a survivalist, stockpiling food and energy drinks in his apartment. And as he told police during an interrogation, he often wore the same pair of underwear for more than one day at a time. McDaniel didn't have much luck when it came to women. He was on eHarmony, but he didn't land many dates. He was also a self-professed virgin, claiming that he was saving himself for marriage. And yet he had condoms in his apartment, a fact that would later prove to be very important in the investigation of Lauren Giddings' murder. That said, McDaniel caught the attention of the authorities shortly after the investigation began. Shortly after Giddings' dismembered torso was found in a trash can near her apartment complex, McDaniel and Giddings' other neighbors had been taken to the police station to give statements about the young woman's disappearance. At the time, none of them knew that her remains had been found. Each neighbor agreed to have their apartment searched, except McDaniel. It's the lawyer in me, he said. I'm just always protective of my space. He eventually allowed one detective to walk through his unit, but only if McDaniel was there at the same time. Given the damning evidence that police would later find in his apartment, it's not surprising that he would want to keep them out. After all, he had Giddings' underwear in there and a stolen master key that he had used to break into her apartment. As Stephen McDaniel stood by while police searched the apartment complex for clues, a local television news station called WGXA sent a crew to the building to report on the story. When they spotted McDaniel standing around, they asked if he would give an interview, and he agreed. At first, McDaniel seemed like any other concerned local who was worried about his missing neighbor. We don't know where she is, he told the reporter behind the camera. The only thing we can think of is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. One of her friends had a key. We went inside and tried to see anything that was amiss. She had a door jam that was sitting right by it so there was no sign that anyone broke in. But by the time McDaniel learned from the reporter that a body had been discovered in a nearby trash can, his demeanor completely changed. Visibly panicked, he was silent for a moment before telling the reporter that he needed to sit down. It was later revealed that only Giddings' torso had been found, and the other parts of her body had been discarded elsewhere. As McDaniel failed to maintain his composure, Police learned more about their person of interest and the disturbing details of his personal life. Authorities would eventually uncover evidence from McDaniel's laptop that showed he'd been gathering information on Giddings and her whereabouts leading up to her death. There was also a series of videos that indicated he'd been stalking Giddings, looking into her apartment unit through a window. The case took a turn for the worse for McDaniel when the computer evidence started coming out, and it just kept coming. McDaniel's attorney, Frank Hogue, later explained that they were continuing to find more and more evidence related to his computer and camera. The fact that McDaniel had posted on a number of internet blogs and forums about his general hatred of women and his desire to hurt them only strengthened the case for his involvement in the horrific murder. But even before police had collected this information, they felt certain they'd found their man based on their initial conversations with him. So, on the same day they discovered Giddings' body, they brought McDaniel into the police station for another round of questioning. Less than 12 hours later, when Stephen McDaniel was brought into the police station again on the night of June 30th, 2011, his demeanor was eerily still. He was also tight-lipped, only answering a few questions, most often responding, I don't know. Even when detectives were out of the room, McDaniel sat perfectly still. The interview stretched on into the early hours of July 1st, and McDaniel still had nothing to say. Detective David Patterson grilled McDaniel for hours, asking about Lauren Giddings' location, asserting that he knew McDaniel knew what had happened. He also acknowledged McDaniel's shift in demeanor from how willing he'd been to talk earlier in the day on June 30th. Eventually, 
Detective David Patterson left the interrogation room and Detective Scott Chapman entered. After another series of questions and no real answers, Chapman attempted to appeal to McDaniel's humanity. We want to give you the opportunity to tell it, he said. So you don't look like a monster at the end. I know you feel bad about it. Though the gravity of the situation was clearly weighing on McDaniel, he still refused to share any meaningful information with Chapman. It was only when Detective Carl Fletcher entered the room that McDaniel slipped up. McDaniel didn't admit to murdering Giddings that night, but he did admit to an unrelated crime. At one point during the interrogation, Fletcher mentioned condoms that had been found in McDaniel's apartment. Since McDaniel was supposedly a virgin who was saving himself for marriage, why did he have condoms? And where did he get them? As McDaniel put it, he had previously entered a few of his classmates' apartments while they were out and taken condoms from them. In other words, he confessed to burglarizing his classmates' residences. Because of this, he was arrested on burglary charges as police gathered all the evidence they needed to prove his involvement in Lauren Giddings' murder. In 2014, McDaniel pleaded guilty to murdering Giddings. He admitted to breaking into her apartment using a stolen master key, strangling her to death, and dismembering her body with a hacksaw in the bathtub. After his guilty plea, he was sentenced to life in prison for the grisly crime. Since then, Stephen McDaniel has attempted to appeal his conviction on numerous occasions, making allegations about ineffective counsel and the theft of defense trial preparations by the state. So far, he has failed with all of his appeals. And though he will be eligible for parole in 2041, legal experts strongly believe that he will spend the rest of his life behind bars. The case of Gabriel Fernandez was far from a secret to teachers and social workers. Though some adults attempted to help him, they didn't do enough. And Gabriel Fernandez was tragically murdered at the age of eight. Since then, Gabriel's case has provoked anger and repulsion. How did his case go uninvestigated for so long? What more could the adults in his life have done to save the vulnerable California boy? And how can social workers make sure that what happened to Gabriel never happens again? This is the story of Gabriel Fernandez and the horrific mistreatment the he openly suffered at the hands of his caregivers before he died in May 2013. Born on February 20, 2005, in Palmdale, California, Gabriel Fernandez had a difficult family life from the start. His mother, Pearl Fernandez, didn't want another child and even left him at the hospital. In fact, Pearl already had a record of child neglect. One year earlier, reports stated that a relative had notified Child Protective Services, saying that Pearl was mistreating another son. But nothing was done. Unwanted by his mother, Gabriel spent much of his life with his great uncle and his partner. He then later moved in with his grandparents. But in 2012, although Pearl had faced accusations of mistreating her daughter and neglecting to feed her, Pearl suddenly insisted that Gabriel wasn't being properly cared for by his relatives and that she wanted him back. Pearl actually took Gabriel back because she wanted to collect welfare benefits. Despite the objections of Gabriel's grandparents, she brought the boy back into her house in October 2012. There, Gabriel lived with his mother, her boyfriend Isoro Aguirre, and two older siblings, 11-year-old Ezekiel and 9-year-old Virginia. Soon afterward, Jennifer Garcia, Gabriel's first grade teacher at Summerwind Elementary in Palmdale, California, started to notice that the boy showed signs of being mistreated. In fact, Gabriel even told her about it. Is it normal for moms to hit their kids? He asked Garcia one day in October 2012. After school that day, Garcia called a child abuse hotline, which put her in touch with a caseworker named Stephanie Rodriguez. Although Garcia initially felt reassured, the abuse of Gabriel Fernandez seemed to continue. One day, he came to class with chunks of his hair missing. Another day, 
Gabriel Fernandez appeared with an injured lip. Garcia continually reached out to Rodriguez, but the caseworker said that she couldn't discuss the details of Gabriel's case. Rodriguez had, in fact, visited the Fernandez home, but Gabriel often recanted his stories and Rodriguez noted that the children at the residence seemed appropriately dressed, visibly healthy, and did not have any marks or bruises. Sadly, his case was actually much worse than Rodriguez, or even Garcia seemed to realize. And in May 2013, Gabriel Fernandez's mom and her boyfriend would badly mistreat the eight-year-old. On May 22, 2013, Pearl Fernandez called 911 to report that her son, Gabriel, was not breathing. Paramedics arrived and found the boy with broken ribs, a fractured skull, missing teeth, and wounds on his body. I tried to feel his heart, Pearl Fernandez's boyfriend, Isoro Aguirre, said, placing the blame for Gabriel's injuries on roughhousing with his older brother. And nothing is moving. It later came out that Pearl and Isoro had tortured him. Gabriel Fernandez died two days later of his injuries on May 24, 2013. And then, in the months following, the shocking depth of his mistreatment and the homophobic motives of his tormentors came to light. The mistreatment happened over the course of eight months. Sometimes, they locked him in a cabinet they called the cubby. They called him gay, possibly because he had previously been raised by a gay great-uncle, punished him whenever they saw him playing with dolls. But despite the many warning signs, he was tragically never rescued. In the aftermath of Gabriel Fernandez's death, both Pearl Fernandez and Isoro Aguirre were arrested and charged with the boy's murder. Pearl pled guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. I want to say I'm sorry to my family for what I did, Pearl Fernandez said in court in 2018. According to the Los Angeles Times, I wish Gabriel was alive. Every day, I wish that I'd made better choices. I'm sorry to my children and I want them to know that I love them. The judge, however, didn't mince words. He said that Gabriel's death had been so horrific that he'd almost call it animalistic, except animals know how to take care of their young. Aguar was also found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to death. Currently, however, California has suspended all capital punishment, so Aguar remains in prison for the foreseeable future. But they weren't the only people to face consequences for Gabriel Fernandez's death. Four social workers, Stephanie Rodriguez, Patricia Clement, Kevin Baum, and Gregory Merritt, faced charges of falsifying public records. However, reports stated that an appellate panel in January 2020 decided that they should not face criminal charges. Now, Gabriel Fernandez's loved ones can only hope that his horrific death wasn't entirely in vain. Though he had clearly slipped through the cracks of the Los Angeles Department of Child and Family Services, the department vowed to begin a new era of reform after his murder. Reports state that the organization added new policies to ensure child safety, hired more than 3,000 new social workers since 2013 to lighten caseloads, and retrained current caseworkers on how to effectively interview witnesses and notice physical signs of abuse before it's too late. Will it be enough? According to reports, several mistreated children in the Los Angeles area and elsewhere were killed in the years following Gabriel Fernandez's death. As such, there's clearly more work to be done. Tragically, Gabriel Fernandez's death was entirely preventable. After his teacher notified social workers of the abuse, something could have been done. Instead, the little boy was left to suffer and die at the hands of his own caregivers as the city of Los Angeles turned a blind eye. If you enjoyed the video, please show your support by subscribing and liking the video and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any future uploads.